All right, well, welcome back. Okay, so previously, previously we opened up our developer tools. We did a console log for this data and we saw this error. Now, if I remove the comments and I go back and I click on generate image, we get undefined. Now we also notice something else happening. This get 404 not found slash after 3000 is constantly refreshing. This is a reminder to us, by the way, in case you're wondering what this is doing, if you notice this, this is a reminder to us that we don't have an index page. And Next.js is fairly biased. It wants an index page. If it doesn't have an index page, it's going to be looking for it. It's going to say, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So if we want to remove that error, which we should do, because now that we're working on functionality, we have to rely on our debugging skills and we don't want to clutter. We don't want to clutter with unnecessary bugs. So in our pages, I'm going to create a new file and we're going to call it index. Remember that file we deleted, the index.tsx? We're going to bring it back. We're going to bring it back from scratch. So I'm going to say index.tsx. And all we're going to do for now in this file is we're going to export default a function called home, which is the home page. That's the slash it's looking for. If I save that and we go back to Chrome and we refresh, now that error goes away. Very, very obnoxious error. And if I click on generate an image, we're going to see we have this undefined. We also have an error for refuse to set unsafe header. And that's just essentially a security error because we're sending an HTTP request. Because remember, we're using localhost HTTP. Uh, you can remove it if you want simply by removing the user agent header or setting up in the server so that the value considers it safe. But just to show you what that is. But now more importantly, that we've gotten rid of that 404, I wanna go back to this. This is the more important thing I want you to focus. This console log data, what is this data? Well, this data should be the data object from OpenAI when we click on the button generate image. It should be prompting us with data image for a response. But it's not working. Why isn't it working? Well, that's because when we when we use JavaScript with APIs, we're actually using, or even more clearly, when we try to access API calls with JavaScript, these are asynchronous asynchronous requests, something that we call promises. Now, JavaScript has asynchronous features, but it is not inherently asynchronous. It's actually synchronous, meaning that the code, if I, meaning that the code on this page is running synchronously. And if something doesn't work properly, if this API key, for example, isn't grabbed in time before the next line of code goes, Will JavaScript wait for that API key to come back and then generate it? Well, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's not made to do that, right? It's not C. This is JavaScript. We're not spawning multiple threads willy-nilly here. We have one thread, and that thread is running synchronously right now. Of course, there's ways around that. So how can we make it asynchronous? Well, remember, the API key is coming from somewhere else. So we have to send a request and then wait for a response. That request goes to OpenAI, right? Now, if that request takes a longer amount of time, we want to make sure that no matter, we want to make sure that JavaScript waits before it continues to run to grab this data. This data is the create image data because OpenAI is going to then take that, uh, is then going to process, right? It's incredibly fast and it's incredibly powerful, but it's not so incredibly fast that it's gonna go faster than the incredible speed of JavaScript because JavaScript is also incredibly fast. That's why we use it to build applications, right? So all of that being said, in order to facilitate this asynchronous activity, there is a pattern we can use in JavaScript called async, async await. Now, async await is a pattern that's a statement. So this function generate image is an asynchronous function because it's accessing the AI, right, with an API. So the first thing we want to do is right after our equal sign, we want to type in async, and that's going to enable asynchronous activity into this function. So this is the first part of the pattern. The second part of the async await pattern is the await keyword. Now the await keyword can be used multiple times. 
and we can place it wherever we want JavaScript to wait. Right here is where we want JavaScript to wait. We want JavaScript to wait until this prompt is created. We want it to wait until OpenAI creates, you know, creates the image. And then once it's created the image, once we've authenticated the API key, once we've retrieved that, once, once all that is ready, then we get the data. Because if we don't wait for it, then that data is going to be what? Well, it's going to be undefined. All of that is to say that after constant response or result, or whatever you want to call it, probably more succinct to call it a result, that result should be awaited. So we use the await keyword. So async await. Now, I could have just wrote async await and told you quickly, oh, by the way, it's async await because we got to wait for the response and that's how it works. I gave you a thorough explanation of how JavaScript works fundamentally. And if you can provide that explanation on a job interview, when you do an API call, well, hats off to you. Is that some serious brownie points? All right, so, see, so hopefully that can sink in. Let's go ahead and save this. And let's go back to our browser and refresh. And now let's click on generate image and see what happens. All right, now, I had to wait two or three seconds. I had to async await. Underneath this error, take a look at that. What's that? That is an object, my friend. This object holds data, so we can open it. When I open this, we see the number that was created, and then we see the data. If I click in data, we see the zero index object, first array, and we have a URL. But now that we have asynchronous calls and we're fetching data properly and waiting for that data, we now have the power. We now have the power to grab the, the response. So let's save that for the next lesson, but hopefully the past couple of lessons are beginning to really tie things together. You're starting to learn more about JavaScript, trying to see more of the power in using Next.js, and also you're starting to really see why, what the benefit is when you're working with APIs and how, and how amazing it is to just use methods if you know how to use them correctly how much time you can save and how much power you get through the experience when you do it okay fantastic very exciting stuff we'll stop here in the next lesson let's see if we can actually get closer to digging up this image data and getting it to run in our application all right i'll see you there bye bye okay so our api key is working and configured properly we also have a nice looking front page for our application, things centered, some nice CSS, and all the key components that we need. And with the API configured and everything working on our app and our code, and by the way, we should all be on the same page, especially if you're coding along. The fantastic news now, the very, very fantastic news is that when we click on generate image, it takes a couple seconds because remember, we're doing this asynchronous activity of sending the API data over to OpenAI Dolly. Then Dolly generates this object and then sends that information back. So you do have to wait a few seconds, but then we see down here in our developer tools that we get this data. We have an array and we have a URL. And this URL, if we look closely, and if we look closely at this, could this be our image? Could this information contain a response from Dolly? Well, it absolutely could, and it absolutely does. And that's what we're going to look at in this lesson, is how do we extract this data using JavaScript.notation, and then store this data into the application so that we can render it accordingly. And we do this with something called state. And when using React, that the best way to do that is with hooks when we're building a small when we're building a small scale application, uh, step by step, such as this. So we're gonna learn about state and hooks and while we extract this data in this upcoming lesson. Very exciting and very cool stuff. So let's get started. Let's go back into our code and fire this project up. So right now, the way that we have things set up is that we created a onclick handler event for when we click on this button to generate an image. And we have a function here that's asynchronous, and what it does, if you recall, is that it leverages the OpenAI, which is now hooked up to the API key, which we get with our public runtime configuration, to run this method, create image, 
which then takes some object properties. And these are the things that we can play with. So right now, we have a prompt that's hard-coded to a white Siamese cat. All right, we have the number amount, and then we have the size of the image. Then what we do is we get this data as a response, and we're logging out the data, which shows up in our development, in our developer tools. And by the way, if you're not sure about these developer tools, you can get them on Chrome. You just go scroll down, view, developer. If you're using another browser, then it also has its own way of getting the developer tools. It could be slightly different. You have to work with that accordingly. So logging the data is good, and seeing that there's a response is very good. But the next step here, the next logical step is storing that data, not just putting it out on the developer log. So how do we store that? Well, we can store information with something called state. And state is a term in React, which is basically describing how to store and manage data that affects components, behaviors, and then renders that information to the user. We can store data with state and then we can also set the state to change the data or manipulate the state. And we do that with hooks. And this hook is called the use state hook. So we store state and then we can set the state. And why is this so, so super important? Well, because that's the crux. And that's the word I was looking for before, the crux. That's the crux of JavaScript, of the power of using JavaScript in an application, right? It's one thing to be able to build an app that can, refetch and, that can fetch data and look pretty. But it's another thing to do something with that data for the users, to keep track of the data, right? To keep track of user information, what the user is doing with the data, how that's changing on the application. That is what we mean by state. So how does state work in React? And the best way to answer this question is to look at this URL and this data, and let's store that state and then manipulate it. So we're gonna go back into our code and we're gonna bring in a React hook. So we're gonna import use state and that's it for now, right? Just use state from React, okay? And we'll save that. And by the way, hooks is a bit, is a popular term in React. If you're not sure with that, what that means, hooks are functions that allow you to add state and other React features to functional components, all right? And use state is one of the most common ones. And we're gonna look at a couple different hooks in this course, but let's start with use state. So use state over here, let's make this bigger. So, so use state is basically a hook that we can now bring in that can help us to set up uh, a re set up the result that we're receiving right now that we're receiving right now when we generate this image this result here that's what we want to focus on so how do we actually set that up with code well what we can do is at the top of our of our component app we're going to bring in a new variable const and we're going to declare through the structuring and this is just the syntax that you use with the array, a result, right? Let's just say it's gonna be a result. And then the best practice here is whatever you name the first element, which is for storing the state, then the second element is for changing, is for changing the state, you want to add the word set because we're setting something to that state. So in this case, because we're creating a variable result, then we're gonna change that with set result. If that's a bit confusing, I promise it'll make sense. Let's just stick with it for now. So we set this up to use state. And if this looks confusing, this is array destructuring. So we're extracting the data from an array. Re use state essentially returns an array with two elements, right? Result and set result. And we want to grab both of those elements. So this is just the syntax. And if it looks a little confusing now, it's actually quite uh, intuitive once you do it a few times and nice to look at. I promise you just have to get used to it. So we're gonna say use state, and this is our func this is our hook. So we bring in our parentheses, and we can initialize result with use state with whatever we put inside of here. What do I mean by that? Well, what is result? Well, we want result to be this, right? We want it to be the URL essentially of an image. So for now, let's just use a placeholder so that when users come to our page, they won't see nothing, right? If I actually load up our app over here, they're gonna see this. We want them to see a default placeholder so they understand that this is where the images are being generated, right? A little bit of user experience and UI. So where can we get a placeholder image to set up our initial state? Well, there's a few free places where you can do this. You can put up anything you want, really. 
Well, if you just Google free placeholder images, and we can do a person, and we go to images, one of the first ones that should pop up, actually, I think I saw it over here, but you can really use anything. But this one, for example, avatar icon placeholder, free vector graphic on Pixabay, all right? If I right click on this, what we can do is we could technically copy the image address and we can do this for learning purposes. And we can go back to our code and in our use state, we can initialize it to that endpoint, to that image. And then you could really initialize it to any image you want, right? Like I'm just showing you an example of what you could do, right? So the point though, is that when we do this, and let's actually end our expression, but the point is that when we set this up, what we're doing here is we're destructuring from use state these two elements, one for setting our state, which is going to be this because we're initializing it, and another element which we're going to use later on to change that state, not from the hard-coded image that we just found online over, over here, but from what we're truly after, which is this, right? Like an actual image that you're going to generate, all right? Now, if that's a bit confusing, bear with me because we're about to see this puppy in action. For now, what I'm going to do is we're going to go down to our return statement and underneath our button, we're going to make blank tag. And within this tag, we're going to set up an image tag. And let me make this bigger so you can see. So we're going to have an IMG tag, which is self-closing, and that's for setting up an image. And for now, what we're going to do is set the source to equal what? Well, we want it to equal the state that we just initialized here. So we're going to set the source to result. Best practice to have an alternative in case it doesn't load uh, with the image. And for now, we could just say result. So it's just good to put it in to ignore warnings for now. And let's just save that. And let's go back to our app and have a look at what, what's going on. So if we look now, take a look. Now, when we go to localhost, we actually see this image propagating. And that's very cool. That means that our state is working. So fantastic, fantastic stuff. And this is a good stopping point because what we've covered here is the initialization of state in React and the importance of using hooks and how this all ties in together. All right, so it's an important lesson. You can stop here and the next video, let's actually take a look at how to change and manipulate this state with the set result. So we're gonna go ahead and hook it up so that when we click on the button, we can actually change this state from being a regular hard-coded initialized value into data that we're getting from our dolly. Very cool. Okay, awesome. So I'll see you in the next video for more cool stuff. See you there. So now we have a basic understanding of state management and we're rendering this image that we've initialized in state with this result. Next step is to be able to click on generate image and then change the state, manipulate the state to actually bring in the URL from Dolly. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to use the set state element from our use state hook. So if I go back here and we scroll up, we see that we have result, which we're using to render and set result, which we haven't used. So where can we actually use set result? But we want to use it when we click on this generate image button. When we click on this generate image button and we have this function generate image, which should technically fire it off. Right now, we're just getting this data and we're logging it out. But instead of logging it out, if we want to make the switch, what we could do is we could say set result to data. Now from data, what we want to actually grab is in dot notation, data within data, because remember this data is the data that we set up. But we want to actually grab the endpoint of data in the object, which we'll see. And then if you remember, it's the zero, it's the zero index array. And specifically what we want is the URL. Now, if there is no URL, we should just get a uh, response saying no image found for now. So these two slashes, these two vertical slashes, create an or statement. But this or statement checks a truth value. So if this isn't there, then we're gonna do this. So let's end this expression and save, and let's go back to our app and see what happens. Very exciting moment in time now. So I'm gonna restart. So I'm just refreshing our local host so we can clear out all that stuff.
in our dev tools. And what we're going to do is click on generate image. So we click, so we're clicking on generate image and it took a couple seconds, but if you take a look, if you take a look, what is that? Well, that my friends is a white Siamese cat. And does that make sense? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Because our prompt is set to a white Siamese cat. Can we change the prompt? Can we change this prompt? Well, what if I switch it from a white Siamese cat to a cute Persian cat drinking coffee under the moon? So if I were to save this and we go back to our app and we click on generate image, well, we got to wait. So we're going to have to wait a couple seconds. And would you take a look at that? What is that? That is, my friends, a very cute cat drinking coffee under the moon. Our application has some real functionality now. Fantastic. This is very exciting. Now, of course, it's just being hard coded to what the prompt is, but let's take this win right now because this is a fantastic win. We've set up our state to now, now grab the data specifically from the object. And where does that data come from? Again, just so we're clear. Well, again, if I console.log the response.data, or sorry, just the data, and we save and we go back to our app and we click on generate image. We wait. It is a little bit of a waiting process, right? The artist has to work. If we take a look, we see we get the same thing. So we have a cute cat drinking coffee under the moon. But if I open up this object now, remember, we're grabbing the data in the data. So this is that data. We want the zeroth index. So that's at zero. And within zero, we want the URL. And that's the URL that we are displaying, which gives us this image. Fantastic. So I just wanted to show you the dot notation and why data structures are so important in JavaScript and why it's important for you to master them by practicing on your own so you understand how to grab things from APIs, right? Uh, specifically here, we want that URL, so we just have to do a little bit of digging, a little bit of pointing, and we get it. All right, so we should all be on the same page. Very exciting. Let's stop here. And in the next lesson, let's actually move from this hard, let's move from hard coding the prompt to switching it to capturing what's in this text area and outputting something um, dynamic, right? And not just the same thing over and over again, but something that our users can come up with. Okay, I'll see you there. Bye-bye. Meow, yeah, let's do more coding. <laughs> okay, welcome back. So, um, by the way, you're probably generating your own images, and of course, they're not going to look exactly like mine. I'd be very shocked if we were getting the exact same images, right? Because these are being rendered through Dolly. And then plus, you may be playing around with the prompt and not typing in what I'm typing in, and that's perfectly, perfectly fine. But we don't want to continue this application where it's just developers setting up our own hard-coded prompts. We want to have a user experience where the user can type into this text box input and then generate the response of what's there. So how do we capture that? Well, it always comes back to state. So let's continue coding out more state so that we can actually get a dynamic response when we click on generate image and not just what we're hard coding. Right now, if I go back in the code and we take a look at our text, let's go up to this prompt. This prompt is really what's hard coded, right? A cute Persian cat drinking coffee under the moon. If we want to make this dynamic, well, this prompt, what we could do effectively, instead of hard coding it, why don't we set it up to something that can change, some state with a React hook, and store that information and then manipulate it. So I'm going to delete this entire prompt, and instead I'm just going to write a new variable called prompt. Now, it's not going to realize that prompt exists yet, so we're going to get this error because we haven't initiated it. So we're going to scroll up, and we're going to create more state. So underneath our result state, we're going to create a prompt state. So we're going to have prompt. And then what do you think our changing prompt element should be called? Well, set prompt, right? Hopefully you, hopefully you thought of that. And you're starting to, starting to see the patterns here. And for now, we're just going to initialize it to an empty, uh, into an empty string. Use state. And we're going to keep it as an empty straight because if we don't keep it as an empty string and we write Persian cat, then we're just basically doing the exact same thing. And we're in a very biased 
format, right? It would be biased because we're, then we're also creating that first initialization. And we don't want to make it biased. I don't want it. We don't want it to be biased. So if we save this now, we shouldn't be running into any real errors. Fresh. We're going to get back this placeholder, which makes sense. And if we were to click on generate image now, we're going to get an error because right now our prompt is set to nothing, right? Our prompt is set up. So the next question here then is, well, how do we actually change our prompt so that it doesn't, so that when we type in the text area over here, it'll update the prompt. Well, let's take a look at what's going on in this, in this text area. Right now in this text area, we have some styling and we have a placeholder. Well, just like in our button where we had this on click attribute, there's another attribute in text area similar, also an event handler, and that's an on change. And on change is just going to check to see when everything is changing and then do something depending how we set it up. So what we can do is we can type in on change and instead on change. And what is it exactly that we want to have happen here with on change? Well, on change can be equal to a function like generate image. But in this case, the function is pretty standard and we don't want to have, and we're, uh, and we're not going to write so much code. So we can actually just create a callback function that's going to set off set prompt to what? Well, to the value of what we're typing. And how does that look? Well, an, anon well, an anonymous callback function won't have a name. It'll just have a parenthesis. We could give it the argument of E for event because we want an event to happen. We're going to use arrow functions as we discussed because it's better. And what we want to change is set prompt. And what, we, and what exactly do we want to set prompt to? Well, we want the event and then we want to target the value and this will default the value of the text area and the value of the text area is the input if we save this and we go back to our app and we refresh now now if we type a cat drinking coffee on mars while learning to code with their computer Let's click on generate image and see what happens. Okay, so it took like a couple seconds for me, but if I scroll down, take a look at that. We've got a cat uh, learning to code something, some Japanese thing, and how's that coffee kitty? Meow, it's, it's meow-rific. Okay. So art critics analysis aside, now our app is actually generating images. It's generating images based on the text area and not area dynamically and not hard coded. And hopefully you see how we managed to do that. All we're doing here is we're bringing in another event handler on change. And then we just have this function that sets off set prompt, right? And set prompt is the state that we want to update because right now pro set prompt is going to uh, manipulate prompt. And prompt is what we're updating in our AI, in our generate image. And it's as simple as that. And it might seem like a few steps, but you just got to follow the logic and it'll make sense. And just like that, we now have code that works. We now have code that works. And that's fantastic news. It's fantastic news. So this is great. So let's stop here. And in the next lesson, I want to take a look at optimizing this code. Because there's a few issues happening. One of the issues is the loading, right? When something loads, it's taking a couple seconds because you've got to generate this image. So it would be great to have a loader so that when we do click on generate image, people realize that we're actually generating an image here and that it's not here and that it's not just broken, you know, because it takes a couple seconds and we know that the attention span, attention spans these days, well, that's just unacceptable. But you see, we did get another image. Fantastic. Very, very cool. However, it would be important to think about, well, how can we do this so that users really understand that, okay, it's loading, don't close the page or don't think it's broken or anything like that. So let's save that for the next lesson. Very, very awesome stuff. I'm super stoked that we actually have this app functioning now though. That's, that's the key. Do some celebratory push-ups or whatever it is that makes you excited. Uh, and reward yourself with something for getting this far. And whenever you're ready, I'll see you in the next lesson with our Space Cat friends for more coffee and coding. Bye-bye.